Nau mai hoki mai, nau mai whakokotahi mai i raro i te maru o tēnei o ngā wānanga tuarua o te rangi nei. Uh, nei rā kami hiki a koutou. Hopefully, everyone had a um, time to grab a quick cuppa um, before our next session, but as the kōrero goes, ko te kai a te rangatira he kōrero, um, so you probably don't need any, any nourishment because we're having all of this knowledge to keep us sustained, all this nice sparkly knowledge. Um, with that, I'll pass over to you, Izzy, for our next session. Kia ora. So the project in the spotlight for this session is state of the art surveillance. Surveillance is an essential part of protecting New Zealand's economic assets and natural taonga from damage, damaging exotic organisms. The government currently spends over $125 million a year on monitoring for biological threats. And it's an expensive process because it requires thousands of hours of highly skilled human labor. The state of the art surveillance team is developing prototype technologies that will automate and improve surveillance results while saving costs. First up, it's my pleasure to introduce Tama Blackburn. Tama is a Taranaki local, a dock ranger, and identifies as a man of many past lives, but is currently studying for a master's degree at the University of Canterbury. Tama's presentation is entitled Introducing Taranaki Communities to Innovation. So take it away, Tama. Oh, kia ora. Kia ora, kia ora. Um, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, kua hau i raro i te maunga Taranaki. Ka whakahau o rā hau i te awa o Aitara. Uh, ko aotea me tainui ngā waka. Ko Ngāti Mania Poto te iwi, engari no Waitara tōku kainga noho. Uh, kia ora tātou katoa. Um, so here, my name is Tama Blackburn. Um, te hau tupua of the Taranaki Maunga Project. That's the Science and Innovation Lead. Um, Maunga Project is a uh, ambitious restoration project, 34,000 hectares of the Egmont National Park and the Ngamotu Islands. Um, it's a collaboration between the Next Foundation, Department of Conservation, Manaki Whenua Land Care Research, uh, Toi Foundation, Jasmine Foundation, and the Taranaki Iwi Chairs Forum. Um, and so, yeah, the kaupapa we talk about today, or my kaupapa, is introducing Taranaki communities to innovation. Um, so it's one of our, our major values with the Manga Project is to incorporate and include our communities wherever we can. Um, so in this case, it's environmental DNA tools and methods. Um, and so the big question that we had to answer was, how do we prove the absence of ungulates? Um, goats being the main contributor there, that was the last target, um, but removing the deer, pigs and and whatnot, or the ho hooved animals. So, um, so we're utilizing what we have at most, which is rivers. We have a lot of rivers coming off our mountains. Um, so we have uh, three big hills, Taranaki, Pawakai, and Kaitake. And so there's many, many rivers. So we thought um, we'd use those to our advantage. Uh, and that's when we, we were put in contact with Wilder Lab here in Aotearoa. Uh, and big thanks to Sean Wilkinson and Amy Galt for their guidance and um, and including us in their trial program. Um, so, yeah, one thing about those tools and methods is they're not completely um, ready to go to market. They are good, but we were working on uh, making them better. So, um, how do we do that? Uh, so, we we want to share the knowledge um, if we keep this to ourselves then it's a, a very linear game we're not going to um we're not going to uh, we, we're probably going to repeat the same mistakes so um so when we reached out to our community groups that we are uh, very close contact with our hapu and our iwi um, uh, other jobs for nature projects that are operating in the region um, we have uh, students here on internships with our other researchers within the, the rohe and so we pulled them all together and said hey you want to be part of this um let's go and play with these new tools and put them to the test so um these are some of our communities you see on your screen so um we have our jobs for nature apprentices we're putting them through some um, study at the moment so this was part of their studies um ticking off their uh, practicals and then we've got you know our community groups the kiwi trust they play a big role and a great partner in our project um, and so the tools we're using with a passive uh, sampler in the water catchments and then we're trialing out a, a new technique called uh, it's 
called tread DNA or shoe DNA. And that was testing the, the whenua, the, the earth. So um, we were testing the water and then we tested the, the land. So in the, the bottom corner, you can see three of our apprentices had to swab their boots. Um, I've never seen uh, young fellas like this clean their boots so many times in a day. So it was quite entertaining for me. So I took lots of pictures and videos. Um, and that was a great experience for them to understand the tiny little things that we never see. Um, so it was really cool. Um, and then to expand on our project, um, we're working with uh, Professor Neil Gemmell, who has been awarded some funding through MB to do more research on uh, environmental DNA. So we're looking forward to bringing him up here, him and his team, and introducing him to our communities that have now practiced with these tools, and hopefully they help him with his research as well. So it'd be a great collaboration there. Some of the challenges we went through. So, um, so first of all, understanding the tech and the research and, and convincing the community that it's not a ready to go product yet. So um, kind of lowering the expectations that you know, we're not gonna hit the mark straight away. We, we are part of the development. Um, so that was, that was something, the first challenge, the mental mindset there. Um, is it safe for our community? So um, picking the right in, environments, uh, the right weathers and things like that to go out in. We don't want to hurt them or harm them and we want it to be enjoyable. So that was part of the plan. Um, and then another big question for some of our communities is what happens to that research and is it tika and kawa? So we had those conversations um, and it was all agreed that it was a shared, it was shared knowledge because this is new knowledge um, and we are sharing in um, finding it and then sharing in, in what it means and understanding that. So, um, and then who carries out the research and why? So, same thing, including everybody into this. Um, and then the big question, is there existing mātauranga in te ao Māori? Um, and whether this, this research can help us find that knowledge. Um, because there's a lot, of, a lot of things that are hidden within karakia and waiata and, and ngeri and, and pūrāko stories and within carvings that we haven't quite deciphered properly yet, um, especially with our Taranaki maunga, due to the, the massive disconnection there with the people in the mountains. So... Um, it'll be interesting to see how how this new knowledge can be translated into that and, and vice versa. And then, yeah, the, our last challenge, can these tools be used to benefit Māori? So uh, that goes into um, creating new new stories and new karakia, new waiata, and a way to carry those um, that knowledge into the future rather than just a big written report. Um, and so, yeah, I'd, I'd like to chuck out some thanks uh, to Steve Pawson for connecting with me and, and with our group and allowing us this opportunity to share. Um, Sean Wilkinson and Amy Galt at Wilder Lab, they've been amazing and uh, made it so easy to understand this technology. Um, Professor Neil Gemmell, who's been um, included us in the, his research, and we're welcoming him in to our rohe for research. And obviously our toa taiao, our rangers, so there's a couple of the guys there, there's um, a tua kanatena relationship there, the experienced, <laughs> experienced man with his hands in his hips and the, the young one doing the mahi um, and then our communities and our, our iwi for allowing us to carry out this research um, and so I'll leave you with a whakatauki um, among a project follows uh, he hua te manga manga nui kia tupu whakarito rito te toe a te kawa ora so removing the obstacles so well-being can thrive uh, and that can be applied to removing the pests and predators removing uh, policies and procedures and removing mental models that can prevent us from going to that next level of research, development, and innovation. Uh, no reira, uh, kia ora koutou katoa, uh, kia pai te rā. Kia ora, thanks Tama for a great presentation um, and a reminder as well for the audience to drop any questions in the live Q&A, you know the drill by now. Next up, uh, with the pre presentation titled Future of Autonomous Biosecurity Sensing, we have Professor Richard Green. After running his own successful software company in Sydney, Richard has been lecturing in computer science at the University of Canterbury, where he also heads up the UC Computer Vision Research Lab. Take it away, Richard. Okay, done. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Thanks. Hi everyone, uh, kia ora and um, yeah, great to um, have so many people here watching this. Um, it's fitting that I followed Tama because I was born in Taranaki and grew up 
with a view of uh, Mount Taranaki from my kitchen window. So, um, yeah, so that was great. Um, I just thought I'd start with this video because this is um, something got a, a million dollars for a few years back for um, weaponizing a drone with something that can cut trees. And that drone you just saw flying around did that completely autonomously using a tool. So when um, you know Tom was talking about you know environmental DNA samples, it sort of made me realize well actually. Um, we're already working on drones um, with tools. In fact, I just got another $10 million for um, enabling drones to have really high precision use of tools, which could mean that um, we're already on the way to uh, collecting DNA samples. But the point of this presentation is to talk about the future, sort of thinking 10, 20 years ahead, what is the impact of um, biosecurity surveillance? So there's uh, some really huge advances um, in AI, which we are using with a whole lot of autonomous robots and drones to do a whole lot of um, various um, biosecurity jobs. So it's really becoming obvious that um, within 10, 20 years, almost any manual tasks that you need in collecting biosecurity samples or sensing, um, going out and taking photos or whatever, that we'll be able to do with um, autonomously with with swarms of drones and so on. And often I get the question by reporters, so you're taking jobs away from people, but you know then you go back to the 1800s and you know most of us were on the land and now most of us are in the city and we're not all un unemployed because we're not on the land. Um, just society changes to roll with um, the flow. So I mentioned computer vision because it's a really port important part of AI, as you all know, with um, remote sensing analysis and so on. And um, the goal of computer vision is to recognize objects and track their motion. And it's so important to us that 50% of our cerebral cortex is just dedicated for vision. So clearly it's very important for our survival as well. We know we're close to human um, abilities yet, but we're on the way. So, you know, like we were on the blue curve up until about, you know, like, 18 years ago and then deep learning took off and now it's just working so well that in many cases it's actually working better than humans and just simple pattern matching like recognizing things whether it's disease or some other um, biosecurity uh, incursion so we're getting a really good job of course you need the training data however it's not perfect yet so here's just um, you know an example of you know it running and as you can see that is not a dog that is a cat um, it didn't put a box around the, the trees here. So, you know, it has to be trained really well on what you're specifically looking for. So it's a bit like garbage in, garbage out. Um, however, we have been working on swarm technology and I haven't seen any reason yet why, you know, within 10 to 20 years, we won't have really vast swarms of low cost autonomous drones automatically navigating through dense bush and undergrowth, um, collecting images, but there's a lot of technology this needs and still needs um, that we're working on. And also, of course, the um, permission of CAA. So that just means that uh, drone technology has to get a lot safer. Like that drone you saw on the first slide, I, I wouldn't want that flying without a net between me and it because, you know, when you're running research code on a drone, you're a little bit worried that it might suddenly attack you with the, uh, with the tool that it's using. Um, but We've also made really huge progress on recognizing all aspects of the flora, flora and fauna, um, like trees, um, which is ground, which is trees, parts of trees, branches, leaves, down to 0.1 millimeter. Uh, um, images of trees with very, very accurate 3D models. So we're not just you know, looking at the color and texture of bark and leaves. We can even see you know, deformity of growth and a whole bunch of other things that you wouldn't normally pick up. So this, um, the surface reconstruction, we've gone way beyond stereo, which just uses two images for depth values. We like doing about 200 images, processing them all at the same time in less than a minute to get absolutely perfect submillimeter um, models of things. Um, you know, like when we say model, I mean like us humans have a cognitive model of what is a tree, where is a branch, and it could even tell you the volume, diameter, um, every, Thing that you can see on a leaf and so on. So really huge progress we're making. You know, <clears throat> a lot of people just of, often think in terms of uh, remote sensing from satellites, which is great. 
and there's ever increasing numbers at ever lower altitudes, which is great. So, you know, we're coming up to a time we can imagine in 10, 20 years, there'll always be something above us that's relatively close, but there'll still be cloud in the way and you'll never be as good as a very high resolution camera um, a meter away from something, uh, no matter how good the satellite imagery is. So, um, yeah, so thank you very much. Um, appreciated um, your attention and um, look forward to some chatting with you a bit more on the question and answer session. Thank you, Richard. That was a fascinating presentation. Uh, I'd now like to introduce Manpreet Dami. Manpreet is a senior scientist at Manaki Fenua Lankhead Research. She is a molecular ecologist and is leading the eDNA project within state-of-the-art surveillance. And her presentation is titled Trapping DNA for Terrestrial Biomonitoring and Biosecurity. Kia ora koutou, katoa koumou, putami toko ingoa, kemanaki senua, aho e mahiana. Thanks, Zizi, for the introduction. I'm a senior scientist at Manaki Fenua, and today I'm here wearing my National Science Challenge hat, and I will be giving an overview of the ongoing research within the state of the art surveillance eDNA half of the project. Um, and this work is complementary to the work Richard and Tama had talked about earlier just before. Um, and as the title suggests, I'll be talking about why and how we are trapping DNA for biosecurity outcomes. Um, and as all National Science Challenge projects, I'm representing a group of passionate researchers, collaborators and stakeholders from across various organizations. Since we've had the means to do so, biologists have been trying to understand what makes a species unique. Um, at the very center of the search is DNA, the code to our life, and we've used it to understand how species function, how species behave, how they have evolved to be here. And with, the, with next generation sequencing, um, this process has really accelerated um, so that we can extend this um, DNA-based understanding to detecting where species are. Um, with sequencing becoming faster and more and cheaper, actually, <laughs> we can now collect hundreds and thousands and even tens of thousands of samples uh, to build maps of where species are present. For example, here is a map of all of the earthworms because we need to know that. Um, and here is a map of fungi across the globe. Um, closer to home, here is a list of all the species found from an eDNA or environmental DNA on Hauturu, uh, which is little barrier island. Um, so what we can start to see is that environmental DNA or eDNA for short, can tell us about the species in an environment on a pretty large scale. This application has been especially promising when that environment is aquatic. Um, DNA can move around freely in this environment and accumulate naturally. Um, we've seen both through increased research um, as well as applications coming out of eDNA or eRNA technologies in the aquatic environment, both for biodiversity morning, monitoring, such as looking for fish, invertebrates, other vertebrates that interact with water, um, as well as various microorganisms. Um, uh, we've been able to do biomonitoring around these um, um, species. There are also many proven applications coming out more recently in the diagnostic area, so looking for biosecurity issues, um, such as introduced pests, invertebrate, both invertebrates and vertebrates, or even new to New Zealand species. Um, most recently, uh, there's been detections of um, fall armyworm, which many of you would know uh, recently arrived in Aotearoa, um, out of some freshwater sampling that Wilder Lab has been um, doing. So this just goes to show the um, diagnostic potential of this technology. Uh, but aquatic DNA doesn't encompass everything, unfortunately, uh, especially for some strictly terrestrial species who can never encounter a water body or be blown into the river. Um, the ability to detect certain um, invertebrates um, can therefore be quite limited. Um, a vast majority of biosecurity threats, on the other hand, uh, tend to be um, terrestrially uh, inclined. <laughs> uh, so here we are trying to utilize this advanced DNA-based technology um, to, to try and improve how we can do that in the terrestrial environment. Um, 
because terrestrial environments don't naturally accumulate um, DNA, uh, scientists have been looking at ways of accumulating DNA in more cunning ways. For example, a, a simple household vacuum cleaner um, can be used as a DNA accumulation device. Um, this has been applied uh, very successfully um, to look for capra beetle out of Australia in shipping containers um, to, to vacuum out a shipping container to see whether the associated DNA in that vacuum dust has any of the um, uh, biosecurity threats in it. Um, Similarly, the uh, fresh, uh, the wastewater monitoring for COVID-19 was an excellent example of this sort of uh, smart accumulation of DNA. Um, more recently, there's been some work done by uh, members of our SO4 team that have used bees that are natural accumulator of pollen from various plants um, to see if they're also accumulating pollen of um, weed plants um, or int other introduced species. Um, as well as to look for signs of uh, myrtle rust being carried around by bees. And more recently, there's been work look, coming out to look at viruses, viruses being um, uh, also collected and transmitted by bees. So there's a lot of exciting new ways of aggregating terrestrial DNA. Um, and as I was saying earlier, the, one of the biggest threats to um, our uh, biosecurity conservation estates um, are actually terrestrial species such as insects. Um, and we've been aggregating insects for a very long time, actually. Um, a widely used method of catching insects as an insect trap. Um, and with the right preservative and generalized attraction cues, such as UV light, um, a humble light trap, such as the one Carl is uh, magnificently displaying here, um, can, turn, can turn into a DNA aggregation device. Um, and a network of such devices is already deployed across New Zealand, especially at high risk sites such as ports or transitional facilities. Here is an example of the trap being displayed at um, Port of Tauranga. Um, so Carl's been doing this work for a while and he's been sorting um, through hundreds and thousands of insects, sometimes also including um, new to New Zealand species. And these are the collections that we've been working with. These double up as insect soups out of which we extract um, the uh, cumulative insect DNA uh, to use for diagnostic approaches. Um, but as the sa samples have started to come in, the obvious elephant in the room is how do we manage how much DNA large insects are contributing compared to um, small insects, such as an ant or, or a fly, which can be an equally important um, biosecurity threat. Um, so this is one of the technical challenges that we've been trying to uh, assess. Um, to solve this challenge, we have Pretty Panda who works at Plant Food. Um, she's been developing a size-based filtering method to separate large-bodied insects and small-bodied insects um, to process their uh, DNA separately before combining them all again and in a more um, reasonable ratio um, and amplifying and, and targeting um, four different gene regions to then identify these species. Uh, by, doing, by doing so, she's testing whether we can streamline this process to make it simpler um, and logistically more viable uh, for application at scale. Um, and once we have all this DNA in hand, the next challenge is to try and identify who the DNA belongs to. Um, and to do that well, we have to first identify um, the species that do belong here, um, that do belong around Port of Tauranga and surrounds. So we've developed a rapid DNA database generation pipeline um, using, again, high throughput next generation sequencing. Um, and from the insects that Carl has been busy sorting, we can quickly generate hundreds of barcode sequences and build these local reference databases. Um, this method has just been submitted for peer review by um, members of our team. Um, but as we can all imagine, it's nigh impossible to sequence everything. So we also need to be good at filling in the gaps where we don't have a sequence. Our team um, has also been developing clever sequence mapping algorithms, which I won't go into the detail of, but are available online for anyone to try. And this is work done by um, Sean Wilkinson from Wilder Lab. And this method is also, I think, uh, nearing submission, so it should be more widely available soon. Um, so this is where a lot of the 
that's exciting science for this project sets. We're currently nearing um, one year on this project and we recently submitted our first set of insect soup samples for sequencing. So hopefully we'll have some very interesting results on this soon. Um, but for now we can talk about the overall goals of the program. Um, really the end goal is to develop a workflow that can be adopted across New Zealand by agencies such as MPI, as well as Te Tira Whakamataki, Mari Biosecurity Network, and others by solving some of the challenges to operationalizing eDNA approaches for biosecurity. Um, over the next 12 months, we're going to be specifically working on three main things. First, we'll continue developing this operational light trap um, with solar panels to make sure it uh, can be applied um, over long periods of time. Um, as well as continue to streamline the DNA diagnostic pipeline as an example of best practice use. Hopefully we can develop best practice guidelines other laboratories can also incorporate in um, the work they are developing. Uh, we'll um, be seeking interest as part of this um, science component, we will be seeking interest from our stakeholders for capability development to use these workflows, just like um, Tama mentioned earlier today, we're looking for um, partners to try and apply some of these um, methods, um, including our flagship partners um, like TMBC and Taranaki Manga, as well as others. Um, we're offering student scholarships, particularly to increase Mari participation in the biosecurity surveillance. If your organization see a need for DNA-based surveillance region or New New Zealand Pest, please get in touch. Um, second, the reference database development was actually quite critical um, to generating um, this data to represent our native species, it requires bringing together all interested parties. Um, and to get um, basically the right people in the room so we can develop a cohesive teteriti led approach for developing and de delivering DNA-based solutions for Aotearoa. It will require involving our government partners as well, such as MPI um, and DOC and MFE, and um, we're already starting to put some feelers out within the research community as well as across our stakeholders to bring these people together. So watch the space for upcoming um, workshops and events. Um, lastly, to use such tools, we need a social and cultural license. People can be a bit skeptical around molecular tools. DNA-based surveillance doesn't sound like something I want in my backyard. So we need to socialize these ideas and get feedback to inform our research and adoption um, and research from our team at Walder Lab. And as Tama mentioned already, uh, are helping with uh, developing a community engagement opportunities to reach out where schools and communities and introduce the concept of biosecurity surveillance. There's a lot of promising developments in this space and we're excited um, by the prospect of how this might change um, our ability to monitor and resist biosecurity threats to our biodiversity and production sectors. And I think I won't take any more time. Thank you for your attention um, and look forward to the questions. Thank you, Manpreet. Uh, I now have the pleasure to welcome all of the session speakers back to the stage. Tama, Richard, Manpreet, and of course, our MC Tame. Um, and we're also joined by Steve Pawson. Um, so I'll kick off the Q&A with a question for Richard, uh, which is, you said that within 10 or 20 years, drone swarms could be performing many tasks in support of biodiversity and environmental outcomes. Do you think there will be implementations of drone mounted sensing that might use human pilots as a stepping stone to this? Uh, yes, although what we've found for just pure surveillance, that's okay because we can just stitch images together. But the minute you want to take physical samples, we've found that humans aren't good enough at controlling drones to precisely um, pick something. So we found that we needed to automate that. So even if you did have humans in the loop, you'd still need to have an autonomous mode when you get to the sample that you need to take. Mm. Cool. And a question here for Tama research and you have identified further research and collaboration with DOC, what will make eDNA an operational tool that can be rolled out in national surveillance? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, that all comes down to um, what's the answer you're seeking, um, what's the environment you're using it in. Um, for us, we were using it in flowing water um, and we were trying to capture landscape, like massive landscape. So um, that's not quite ready yet, but if you were to still water and you wanted to know what was what was in there or, or what wasn't absence and presence it's ready to go already 
um, I was really intrigued at how sensitive it was. Um, and yeah, don't put your hands on it. That's how sensitive it was. We can tell you what you had for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Ominous. And another question here for Richard that tickled me a bit, um, which is um, how far away is wilding pine control using drones equipped with poison darts or perhaps lasers uh, or perhaps spraying some sort of RNA eye compound that kills the trees <laughs> or prevents it from producing seed? Yeah. Any comments on that? <laughs> yeah, okay. So um, po <clears throat> poison darts means you can do a very stable platform because you've got, always got breeze blowing around. Um, lasers, we tried that. You tend to burn things and um, they work much better in, uh, in um, control factory environments. <laughs> Uh, and spray has um, a lot of people working on this is um, using um, a survey of an area of pines and then you have an autonomous part on the drone so it positions itself exactly over the tip of the tree and then to really a very very concentrate um, um, spray to kill the tree off yeah so we we're, we're, we're pretty much there you know like I there's a few companies that are already who already have something just about good to go. Yeah. Cool. Exciting. Um, Tame, I wonder if you have any burning questions. I do. Um, there was another question here, though. Um, I've got tons of questions. I've always got questions. <laughs> but from Catherine, um, again to Richard, can you comment on the cost of these new biosecurity technologies and how the, the, the cost... biosecurity technologies? Right. Yeah, no, it's a really good point. Um, well, as you've all noticed, the cost is just plummeting for, for drones and a whole bunch of other things. And the cost of the processing is plummeting. So, you know, what what I see now would cost, you know, like like $15,000 for a really high spec drone. Um, you know, we're talking in about another five years when everyone's used to the technology, it's down to 150 and, and, and lower in another 10, 20 years. So it's just plummeting like anything because so as more and more people get on the bandwagon and go whoa drone um you know then the, the cost plummets so it's amazing how quickly it's fallen all right here's a curveball question for everyone um, i'd consider myself an exponent of technology for biosecurity however like everyone said um cultural and social license to operate is this what happens if we don't get it Let's say for Te Ao Māori, um, and Tama, this is probably for you, Kawa and Tikanga goes, says it's against, using this technology is against our Kawa and our Tikanga, or we don't have the social buy-in from communities, they say, we don't need this, we don't want it. <laughs> then what? Or is that too negative of a question? <laughs> well, no, well, no. Everyone's short, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, coming from a Te Ao Māori perspective, we just continue that conversation. Um, it's no sort of majority vote kind of thing. It's a all-in conversation and agreeance, and it might take compromise. It might take the really dive deep into understanding what the kawa and tikanga is. Like every every place is different. Most places, most people are different. So it's just kōrero, kōrero, kōrero. Can I jump in briefly there, Tama? So when I'm when I'm teaching biosecurity to students here at the University of Canterbury, I often explain to them that you know biosecurity is uh, issues or problems that are, are created by humans. You know, by and large, we're creating the problem, but we're we're also the solution to the problem. Uh, we, we're the ones that can create the solutions. But I also tell them we're also the hindrance to the solution, in that you know often if you if you are wanting to implement some form of operational control, there is going to be some people that that, that don't agree with you or whatever. So it is important that, as Thomas said, you've got to have that core you've got to have it keep it going, and you've got to develop solutions where you do have the buy-in of the people uh, such that they're effective. Because if you don't have people's buy-in, then um, you know, for any kind of sort of biosecurity actions, if, if we don't have the support of the people, then we're going nowhere. So yeah. We've just had oh, oh, one one more quick question come in for Mampreet which is how much more work is required to develop comprehensive reference libraries of sequences so that 90 to 95% of random insect samples taken in New Zealand can be identified to species or genus levels? Hmm. Kia ora, Steven. Thanks for your question. Um, I think it's a really important point. Um, 
as I was saying in the talk, we've actually using a two pronged approach because it's almost impossible to identify, to sequence everything. But at the same time, we do have vast collections of insects in museums and we do have vast collections of insects um, through various avenues where people have been doing monitoring for a while. Um, and as part of that reference generation, we have increased our capability. We can now do over a thousand um, uh, gen the barcode generations, basically, the thousand barcodes at the same time, very quickly. So it comes down to what should we be focusing our efforts on? Because the technology is there. Um, it's it's just a matter of uh, prioritizing um, Taonga species and native species, species that are already here um, to enable that effort going forward. Um, it is a lot of work, but uh, it's easy work when people collaborate and, and get together to do these uh, things. Um, Manaki Fano have been doing quite a bit of um, uh, development of um, reference data like this um, through the um, NZAC and through various um, collections, historic collections that we have. But it's yeah, going forward, it, it's a big team, team effort project. And, and we will be, um, again, reaching out to people specifically to, um, to work on this. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Can't buy. All right, I think time to move on to our um, to our next speaker. Um, but as mentioned, please keep those questions coming through for our speakers. Um, and this is the last speaker for this session um, before we break for lunch. Um, he doesn't really need an introduction, if you ask me. Everyone should know him. But um, Dr. David Toulon is the current director of Better Border Biosecurity a national research collaboration with partners from research, government, industry, communities, and Māori. B3 is the primary research provider for science-based solutions for plant border biosecurity in New Zealand. He has a postgraduate degree in horticulture and entomology and has worked at research institutes and universities in the Netherlands, USA, and Germany. Um, he is a principal scientist at the New Zealand Institute for Plant Food Research and a junk professor at Lincoln University. Um, so with that, I will pass on to you. David, are you there? Kia ora, Tommy. Hopefully I'm here. Um, you can hear me? Great. Thank you very much. So, ko David Tulon Toko Ingwa. I'm the guest speaker today, it seems, that, uh, and I, I take that as I can speak about anything I want to. So that's what I'm going to do. And... Uh, I'll be speaking a little bit about um, SO3 and SO4 and the linkages between. Acknowledge my co authors, Ronnie, Sandra, Mark, Waita, and Albi, representing uh, a number of organizations found within B3. And this work reflects uh, two ongoing projects within B3, led by Ronnie and led by uh, Sandra, respectively. It also builds on other research that we've been doing within B3. So this is an illustration of the biosecurity continuum, reflecting the layered activities to prevent the establishment of invasive species or to mitigate their impact if they do establish. Offshore risk assessment, including knowledge of the potential risks associated with invasive species, provides the basis for many of the actions further down the continuum and in including surveillance, as I'll move on to. This assessment is often based on the known impact of a given pest or pathogen in the geographical area where, that, where it's native or recently established. Now, for many indigenous plant species, risk assessments can be very difficult as these plants are not commonly found in association with those insect, invasive insects and pathogens uh, that we're concerned about except there is one area that we can look at, and that's in botanical gardens, uh, where New Zealand indigenous plants are, are grown. This has led to the rise of the sentinel or expatriate plant concept for pest risk assessment, and that's mostly what I'm going to talk about now. The con concept is, is simple and intuitive where one can look at what is infesting and attacking New Zealand ind indigenous uh, plant species in overseas botanical gardens in areas where those pests and pathogens are well established. 
But botanical gardens come with cultural baggage as well. As many were established during the age of colonization, where ownership of plants and their relationship to indigenous communities was not clearly recognized. B3 has been working in the Sentinel expat plant concept for, for some time. Uh, and we've been working with uh, international collaborators, including the International Plant Sentinel Network and the Bot Botanic Gardens Conservation International. This slide uh, illustrates some of our older work, um, showing uh, the importance of climate matching uh, and shows a number of overseas gardens with similar climates to New Zealand that also have extensive New Zealand plant collections. Uh, these, these are ideal locations where risk analysis using the Sentinel could be undertaken. In recent years, we've explored the Sentinel plant concept uh, targeting gardens with New Zealand plants uh, for a number of, of pests and pathogens. And these are some of the examples. These are actually examples that haven't worked that well. Uh, firstly, myrtle rust. We found only one, uh, information from one uh, garden. Uh, that provided us some useful information on the impact of that particular disease in New Zealand. Zylala fastidiosa, uh, and I'll come back to that in a, uh, more on that in a minute. So we had responses from seven European gardens out of 30, we, we requ uh, requested information, and they basically told us that there was no record of, of this pathogen on New Zealand plants in their gardens. The brown marmorated stink bug, uh, we asked five gardens in the Northeast USA uh, to look at the potential impact of this, this insect on New Zealand plants. And they basically said all of their plants are grown under glass and therefore have limited value as sentinels. And in Italy, uh, we got very little response from, from the gardens that we asked information from. So in some cases, sentinel plants don't seem to work that well. However, uh, Zylella fastidiosa, uh, is one area where we have had some success. Now, this is an insect-affected pathogen. It has a very wide host range. It's a major pest of wine in California and olives in Europe. Um, unfortunately, we have the, one of the major vectors for this uh, organism in New Zealand, and this pathogen is uh, on biosecurity's list of priority uh, pathogens, uh, an organism that we don't want. Based on research carried out by Ronnie Grunterman uh, prior to 2015, Xylella was found in association with a number of indigenous plants in Southern California. We've been carrying on this research with Ronnie leading a project and with Sandra verifying that host range uh, and um, also supporting contemporary molecular diagnostic development uh, to help us understand the, the sequence types that are found in California. Such information on potential uh, pathogen reservoirs in native systems, uh, how we can best uh, speedily diagnose those organisms and what crops they're likely to, to infest when they get to New Zealand will be critical uh, for uh, any surveillance projects that we have. Now, the repatriation of New Zealand native plant samples became necessary through COVID uh, because of our inability to travel into uh, to California. Uh, and a number of plant samples have been returned to New Zealand into containment under biosecurity and strict biosecurity conditions for molecular anal analysis. As part of our growing recognition of our treaty responsibilities, uh, B3 scientists entered into constructive engagement with, with uh, Titura Fakamataki, Maori leaders uh, from MPI and B3's Porangaha Albi Marsh. And this led to uh, awareness of the cultural aspects that travels with these plant samples as they return to New Zealand from California, including Maori, Tapu, and Wairua. So as the plant samples were returned to uh, New Zealand, a small ceremony was undertaken by MPI uh, at the MPI Diagnostics uh, Containment Lab in uh, Tamaki Makaro, Auckland. These included a mihi mihi, a waiata, a katakia, 
Nikai Whakanoa. This wakatao acknowledges the species connection Māori share with nature and looks to express that connection according to uh, Māori and Māori worldview. So just to summarise, um, the jury is out on the value of sentinel plants. It works sometimes and works and doesn't work so well on, on other occasions, and we need to explore that. But it's clear that uh, cultural aspects need to be included and incorporated into this process. So thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, we have time for one more question. Um, and we haven't got anything on the live Q&A just yet. Izzy, do you have one? Because I've got, as I, as I said, I've always got questions. Go for okay. it. Okay. I wanted to turn, um, target in on the, the repatriation aspect. Um, because like you're saying, Māori do see some of these plants as their um, as their ancestors or as relations. As, as, so they treat them as if they were a relation. Um, how does it go in terms of B3, adapting to a Māori approach to something like that? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, in this case, it went pretty uh, straightforwardly. Um, both both project leaders were very open to this, um, and we had Albie Marsh, uh, the B three Maori research leader, helping us uh, in those discussions. Um, so, uh, and then we and then MPI MPI came in to support um, the Fokatau into uh, of the plants into their premises. So. In this occasion, it went time. It went really quite straightforwardly, actually. I think. And I mean, I I'd kind of see you guys as very agile B three um, and able to adapt. What was it like with MPI? Was, did they have policies that restricted anything, or were they able to get straight into it as well? So there are clearly there were technical issues about bringing the the material back into New Zealand, and um, they had to follow those protocols to to the letter of the law, uh, which they did. Um, but in terms of um, in terms of the fokuta, in terms of of the process uh, for tikanga, uh, none of those. I don't think any of those really got in the way, except for the number of people that were allowed into uh, the contain containment facility. So we had to restrict uh, people at that particular point of, of of the process. Okay, final question, and it'll be remiss of me not to ask it, and um, I should be asking about your presentation, but. In terms of future, what should be watch, What should we be watching out for? What's top of, on your list? Uh, pests and diseases. Yes. Uh, well, xylella is one of them. I mean, we, we really don't want to get xylella. So I'll, I'll I'll give two examples. I think on top of mind, xylella is one of them. And 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 what this information is that we're gathering in California is that xylella might be quite. Uh, well, we have to keep an eye on what's going to happen in the natural systems as well as as, as well as the productive systems. And of course, the other one is um, brown marmorated stink bug. And we've just come to the end of the brown marmorated stink bug season, I think. But that's another organism that um, that will be attacking a number of different crops. Uh, so there's a pathogen and an insect for you. Um, I mean, the insect is front of mind for a lot of things. The brown marmorated stink bug. My dad and I were in a um, shop the other day and we saw a, a beetle and. He was interested in it because out of um, concern it might be a BMSB. So if you're reaching um, people like my dad who you know seldom jumps on his phone and stuff, I think they're doing good, pretty good. So well done to B3 and everyone else involved in that. Um, but with that, I'll thank you again for um, sharing your awesome quarter door. Um, and it was much appreciated. Um, always good to listen to you, David. So nam hi kia koe. Otsira kia tato. Ko tata tats otsite wa kia tato. We're almost finished this session. Um, before I wrap up, um, we'll take a lunch break shortly. Um, the next session starts at 1 p.m., so please be back here bright and early for that. Um, we also have a networking session starting at 12.30, so please grab something to eat and join us for this great opportunity to connect with colleagues um, and share some corridor and one on it. Um, don't forget, you can make use of the meeting hub to connect with other participants and visit our exhibitors. Um, any final words from you, Izzy? No, I think you've covered everything perfectly. Cool. Oh, let's go grab something to eat and we'll be back here soon. I'll quickly close this with a karakia. Um, tēnei tātou, ka whakaidi hea i nei kōrero ki te pātū o tēnei whare ki te uh, whatsumanoa o tēnā o tēnā, tūtiri whakamaua ki a tīna, 
tina homie huye kai kie kia ora everyone